Yay. This is amazing. I'm a little nervous to see uh, over 82 people on here already. Um, I'm used to being a public speaker, but for some reason, when I get to talk to like so many amazing animal advocates too, it's, it's different. It's inspiring, but it also makes me a little more nervous because I want to do a great job for all of you so you can go take action on um, what we talk about tonight. But I am so grateful and really, really excited to talk about the small cat crisis. Um, so many people know about the big cat crisis, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And I'm going to do a PowerPoint presentation. Um, but the small cat crisis has been near and dear to my heart and the sanctuary's heart since our inception. Um, we are one of a few handful of sanctuaries that specialize in the small cats. And we're so grateful for others that uh, we've gotten started over the years and are doing amazing work too. But uh, with the big cat crisis, as we all know, uh, we got the big cat public safety uh, law passed. And I wanna talk a little bit about what that does during the presentation, but what's still left to do. So I'm gonna share my screen, bear with me. I am not um, an IT person. I want to share sound, full screen. And can you all see my slide? Awesome. Thank you guys for that. I might move you guys down. So we really um, have always been promoting the small cat crisis, all of you that follow our pages. Um, and of course, you saw small cat cr crisis means a lot like there's a lot of domestic cats. You saw Forrest running across my desk. That's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about right behind me, baby Jenga, or what you see on the screen um, is really uh, about the small cats that are wild cats kept as pets or trafficked or exploited and the uh, hybrids and domestic hybrids. And so kind of our theme is the small cat crisis behind the beauty, because we know that's why most of these people are sharing them on social media, buying them and exploiting them but there is so much um, things that are wrong about these cats uh, being exploited for their beauty. So most of you already know this, so I won't belabor the point, but I'm the founder and director of the Wildcat Sanctuary. We're in Sandstone, Minnesota. We'll be in 25 years uh, next year, which is awesome. Um, we are accredited by the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuary. American Sanctuary Association. We're obviously licensed by the USDA and we're um, founding member of the Big Cat Sanctuary Alliance. Uh, we have rescued from 30 states and four countries. So um, we go a lot past Minnesota. And what I wanna talk to today is who we are, which you guys all know, um, but the big cat crisis and what it means for the future, small cat crisis, uh, the behavioral and medical issues we see with the small cats, why there's a trouble with enforcement, and what solutions we have moving forward to help these small cats. Everything we do at the sanctuary is always going through the um, kind of the laddering to our mission. We want to always provide a natural sanctuary to the wild cats in our care, and of course we want to ch inspire change to end the captive wildlife crisis. We all say that our vision is to help to create a world where wild animal sanctuaries are no longer needed or put ourselves out of business. Um, but to us, that looks like we will not be out of business till every cat is rescued and every cat has a home. And we know that's not gonna happen in my lifetime, um, but we definitely work towards that. So if you haven't seen the sanctuary when it's not covered in snow, this is a little bit of what it looks like in Northern Minnesota. We have right now 134 residents. We have 85 acres, but to be really transparent, only 40 of those are built out. We provide free roaming habitats with indoor temperature controlled buildings for every single resident, big and small at the sanctuary. Um, we have an on-site hospital and a full-time veterinary staff, including a veterinarian and a certified vet technician. And we are one of the few sanctuaries that are staffed formally 24 seven. That means we have three shifts caring for our animals um, throughout the day and throughout the evening, even doing medical treatments up to 8.30 p.m. at night to keep our pain meds as far apart as possible, working the best for the animals. And so if you haven't seen the sanctuary, there's just a little bit more of kind of our setup for mostly our big cats. So the big cat crisis, everybody's uh, familiar with it, but if you're not, what does the big cat crisis look like? 
Um, here is, it's a lot of it was cub petting, photo opportunities, swimming with tiger cubs. Uh, what it did is it fueled uh, a trade in tigers in America, causing a surplus of big cats for those photo op and cub petting opportunities. Um, the history goes back to, it used to be where the public was allowed to do free contact with big cats that were full grown. After Haley Hillebrandt in uh, Kansas was killed during her senior photo opportunity with a big tiger, luckily um, the United States Department of Agriculture changed that. But then they stated that the public can only have contact with cubs between eight and 12 weeks of age for the safety of the person and that the cub would be vaccinated and would be safe for the cub. Well, we learned that the exhibitors found a loophole in that and ended up breeding and breeding and speed breeding cubs for cub bedding operations, photo opportunities. And when the social media hit, it was just the perfect storm to create this huge surplus and exploitation of big cats. And big cats have been in the headlines monthly. I mean, there's tigers loose in Texas from Mexico traffic tiger cubs. You've seen most recently everywhere from Arizona, California, um, even New Mexico. And so, you know, it is a problem. It's not just happening across the world anymore. It's happening in our backyard. So the good news is the Big Cat Public Safety Act, um, which so many sanctuaries worked so hard to get passed, and kudos to everybody involved in that, um, only covers cougars and larger cats. And the legislation is important and does two really wonderful things. It will close the loophole so there's no public contact that exhibitors can do for cub heading. So that takes away the incentive for the breeders to overbreed and always have cubs eight to 12 weeks old. Um, so that we think that will stop the, and curb the breeding uh, a lot in the future. It also phases out private ownership of big cats right now and doesn't allow a private owner to breed the cats they have. So there's still some grandfather clause. We don't want big cats displaced, um, you know, <laughs> if they are being properly cared for. And so it's a huge win, but there is still a need for big cat rescues. And now we have the small cat crisis. So we'll take you through a little bit of why is there still going to be a need for big cats to be rescued? Well, we don't know what's going to happen with this legislation and how well the enforcement's going to be. If the enforcement is good, that's great for the long term. But in the short term, that could mean that animals are seized that aren't compliant with that. It could be larger facilities privately owned. We know that there's breeders and dealers that might choose to dump their cats, big cats, because they can't profit the same way they did before. Um, we also know that there's still several legal cases pending on facilities like Tiger King Park. Um, I won't name those, but there are cases pending and lawsuits out there. So we also foresee that there's going to be large scale rescues and facility closures where big cats instead of one and two, maybe 20 to 40 might need a home at the time. And as you can see in the headlines, really the trafficking of tiger cubs is increasing, especially from Mexico. So most of those cubs that have been in the headlines were trafficked illegally. Um, and that's still happening and we're seeing more and more of that. And there's this exhibitor loophole now. So if you look at that top picture with the little white tiger and that person, that was just taken over the last week at a facility when this isn't supposed to be happening. But what you can't see is they have a piece of plexiglass between the person and the cub. And then they're taking the photo from the cub's perspective. So it looks still like a selfie that people can put on their social media and everything else. So the cub is still getting the same amount of handling it was when it was a photo prop and the person could touch it. It's getting bred as many so that they have cubs. Uh, so we're really hoping that there's some enforcement against this as well. The biggest issue we're seeing is the people that used to do the big cat cub petting have already changed to do small cat. Um, interactions like what you see over here with the serval and caracal. And we know they're going to ex start exploiting the small cats, bears, you know, primates they're already doing. And so um, we're really seeing explosion in the small cat interactions right now. So, you know, what is the most common wild pet reported loose, do you guys think? There's, you know, just think out loud to yourself, um, take a guess. A lot of people, you know, hear the headlines. 
and that might surprise you, it's African servals right now. So we talked about the big cats being in the headlines monthly. Well, servals are in the headlines weekly. And I am going to have to change this to almost say daily. If you set a Google alert for African serval loose, you will get almost daily a cat loose somewhere in the United States. Somebody's pet that got out, got through the screen, could have been abandoned. Um, it has been happening all over. I don't know a sanctuary now that doesn't have a serval that was not found at large. Um, we just have Fiona and Bruno you know about, plus more. Um, and sometimes these cats are out for a short time. Sometimes they're out a long time. Sometimes they've been out six or seven times and returned to the owner. And so that's what we call the small cat crisis. It's, it's just not even the exhibitors. It's coming over into the pet trade. And the reason it is so um, challenging and is going to be a bigger issue is the number of big cat breeders was small in comparison to the number of breeders breeding small wild cats and small hybrid cats. And why is this happening? Well, our social media, I have to say that again, has fueled the trade for the small cats, but this is lucrative for the breeders. So look at the price tags these breeders are getting. And the hard thing I have to say is the breeders really get on our case to say, why are you saying um, Bengals and Savannahs are hybrid cats? They're domestic cats. And we'll go into the difference of that. Well, the reality is the breeders can't have it both way. If that's what they're telling us to try and get us off the back of saying you shouldn't be breeding Bengals and Savannahs and other small cats, then they shouldn't be posting their Bengal cat, Savannah cats um, as an exotic breed at prices of an exotic cat on exotic cat websites with marketing saying, have your own lap leopard, have the look of the wild in your house, all that. Um, they just can't have it both ways. Uh, but this is really lucrative, um, even more so. A uh, full grown Bengal tiger used to be going for $500. Now it's back up to like a couple thousand, but compared to what these hybrids um, are costing, it's, it's definitely lucrative. So when we get to the wild cats or the smaller cats, there's the most common we see in the pet market and being exploited by exhibitors are the lynx, whether it's a Siberian or Eurasian lynx or a Canada lynx, mm -hmm. the bobcat, um, the caracal, and definitely the serval. So these are 100% wild cats. So we're going to talk about the wild cats first, and then we will um, go into the hybrids because it can get confusing. So first, um, definitely shake your head, Gina, to make sure you can this hear this sound. This is a serval cat native to the African grassy savannas, but in this case found wandering in Lincoln. Meet Bruno. He's an African serval that was found loose and in distress in a Massachusetts neighborhood, which is a state where it is illegal to own these cats. Thankfully, the MSPCA stepped in and captured Bruno, where they promptly brought him in to evaluate his medical condition. There are so many unknowns about his story, and sadly, Bruno suffered some significant fractures to his rear leg and has to have it amputated. It'll be a long journey of recovery for this little one-year-old serval. Bruno is the poster child of what horrible things can happen when these kinds of cats escape and can't survive on their own. He should have never been put in this situation. So what's the good news? Bruno is coming to the Wildcat Sanctuary. He will start his journey soon, and we are thrilled to keep you updated along the way. And as you all know, Bruno's been here for over a year now, um, and he is one of a few that get a happy ending. Sadly, there's many that don't. And so when people think again that, oh, Bruno's story is extreme, no, it's not. I wanted to show some case studies. And since we're in mid the Midwest of Minnesota, this presentation I tailored to our local Humane Society. And so there's a lot of Minnesota examples, but just tuning in on just one area like Minnesota to show all the case studies, you know this is being re repeated over and over across the country. Um, this is Scarlett. So many of you know Scarlett, the serval we had. Uh, she was surrendered to us and um, we don't, you know, we just thought it was an owner surrender. Uh, within 24 hours, we were notified that there was a 38, a standoff in a hotel where at first they had, uh, the person had uh, somebody in custody. And we soon learned that he thought this person had stolen and given his cat to us. So he was, he was holding her hostage. Um, he did that for 38 hours, standoff with police in a hotel room. He was throwing things out the hotel room, like toasters in the microwave um, at the police, uh, you know, and he wanted his African serval back. 
Well, that was crazy enough on its own. Uh, but then he also and his family tried to come forward and say that she was a Savannah cat. She was not a serval and that she was legal to own, um, which is not true. She is 100% serval. Um, and then on top of that, we saw when we took her in, she had severe metabolic bone disease. She already had a plated femur that they had brought her into orthopedic surgery for. I'll show you, she had old rib cage fractures and that have rehealed that they compress her lung capacity. She was four paw declawed. And even though we were able to save Scarlett, you know, the breeder goes scot-free. Nobody, and this gentleman got prosecuted, but the breeder, nothing ever happened to. Um, you know, and here's just more on top of it. So on top of the police being involved in that case, when it comes to small cats, so many of our small cats come because first responders were responding to a human trauma or a human issue. Um, Bobcat Mondovi was found during an unrelated racketeering warrant when they went in. Uh, Bobcat Bogart was found when police were called for a human to human shooting at a home. Serval Zambuca came to us after authorities went in on a welfare check of somebody that had passed away from an overdose. And this is not fair to our first responders. So as much as it's not a tiger in the home, this still is a huge public safety factor, especially for first responders that aren't trained and shouldn't have to be trained in how to ID or handle a small wildcat in a home. Okay, so on top of this hybrid, so it's, you probably have a lot of questions about hybrids and I'm gonna hopefully answer them all. Uh, hybrids are the most common ones here and we'll go into all of them is the Savannah cat. So you'll hear a lot about Savannah cats. First or F1 to F3 or first generation to third generation Bengals. And then what we call kind of domestic Bengal cats, cats that have more domestic than um, the wild cat in them. And we'll explain that. So out of 134 residents we have, how many domestic hybrids do you think we're sanctuary is home to? So just think to yourself and see if you get it right. We actually are home to 41. And I will tell you, we probably accept one for every 20 requests we get because the requests are so much. And then if you look at the left here, you'll see we have 87 total small cats. So if people try to tell you there's not a small cat crisis, um, they are crazy. I think the biggest thing is the sanctuary industry really, really um, focused on the big cat crisis and housing big cats because it is a much larger public safety factor when it comes one-to-one -one with an animal and a tiger. But overall, these guys have a public safety risk too, and we'll go through that. So we're going to talk about what a hybrid is. Welcome to another We Learn Wednesday. This week we'll be talking about hybrid cats. We have roughly 40 rescued hybrids at the sanctuary. Hybrid cats are a mix between a domestic and wild cat species. Wild genetics are delineated through filial generation. F1 means 50% wild and 50% domestic. This is F1 Bengal Axel and F1 Bengal Jewel. Bengals are a cross between an Asian leopard cat and domestic cat. Savannas are a cross between a serval and domestic cat. This is F1 Savannah Lady. Thai is a Chowsey, which is a mix between domestic cat and jungle cat. To create these high generations, you have to have a wild cat. Zambuca the serval was an example of this. It was kept as a stud for a savanna breeding program. Wild animals like Zambuca are kept in captivity to keep up with the demand for these wild hybrids. Bengal savanna and other hybrids are becoming increasingly popular as pets. Even domestic generations have trouble litter box training, are loud, multiple health issues, and their wild genetics shine through. We are seeing more surrenders than ever before and can't keep up. So we know Olivia packed a lot of information into her TikTok, so I'll break it down for you a little slower. So um, this is just an example of a savanna, but this is really how hybrids work. You take one wild cat, like the African serval, and you cross it with a domestic cat to get a savanna cat hybrid, um, usually what they call an F1. Usually what they do is they don't even take a domestic cat like a tabby or um, you know any, any type of regular domestic cat. They usually take a Bengal, which is already a hybrid of an Asian leopard cat and a domestic cat. So really that savanna cat is now a compound hybrid is which why we see so many um, animals not living, you know, kittens not living, so many health issues, uh, things like that, because a compound hybrid is not healthy for an animal. But think of it as like a liliger instead of a liger or tigon. So 
you guys always usually hear about the Bengals and savannas. So the Bengal, a lot of people didn't know that an Asian leopard cat is a small uh, wild cat. And it's a very small, about eight to 12 pound cat that's crossed with a domestic cat. And so usually F1 Bengals are really small. Um, savannas, and then and we'll go through, and then when they breed them back to a domestic cat, domestic cat, domestic cat generation, that's when you get the F4s, F5, F6s, which mean they're fourth or fifth generation from the wild. And F4s we'll get into is really what that you consider your domestic Bengal breed. But there's Savannah here that we talked about. The Chassi is a jungle cat, which is a cat from Pakistan crossed with a domestic cat. Safari, which is a Joffrey's cat, which is a South American wild cat, a jungle bob, um, and even a caracal now has a, a hybrid, which luckily is still very, very rare, but we'll tell you why that's problematic. So this is really difficult because if you thought there was a patchwork of laws <laughs> before the Big Cat Public Safety Act became law on big cats, it is worse for the small cats and wild cats. Um, so this is hybrids. So some hybrids like cat, and cat like states allow hybrids. Some only allow certain generations. Uh, some don't allow any at all. So even a domestic Bengal is outlawed. And so it's really, really hard um, to do enforcement. And here's this biggest new thing. If we thought breeding and overbreeding and exploiting servals and caracals and lynx um, were an issue, here's the bigger issue. So now that hybrids can be legal in certain areas, but small wildcats like servals and caracals are becoming more and more illegal. People are lying to authorities and lying to their veterinarian. And when they have an African serval, they're saying it's a savanna cat. Um, and that is a huge issue. I can't tell you, I know um, Wildcat Ridge, us have multiple servals that the owners claim to be savannas um, and that the paperwork they falsified said was a savanna cat to skirt laws and ordinances. Um, so this is getting even more confusing for authorities to enforce. It's happening with bobcats too. Uh, I can't tell you how many times people have pet bobcats that have bit and they bring them to PetSmart, they get loose, uh, they get seized by authorities and they say, nope, I, that's a pixie bob, it's not a bobcat. Um, and, or it, and so it's very confusing for authorities. So why don't we test what you guys know already? In your head, is this a pixie bob or is this a bobcat? I would guess that this group probably is very good at this and agrees that this is a bobcat. And if you do, you are correct. Um, this is about a six month old bobcat. This is a bobcat that had bit somebody in PetSmart that had uh, been loose twice and brought into Texas Animal Control. Um, the owner claimed it was a pixie bob. We identified it along with several other sanctuaries that this was actually an adolescent bobcat. And easy to tell, huge paws, coat patterns spotted. I call it the Sophia Loren around the eyes, the white eyes, the markings on the back of the ear, and this is already larger than a Pixie Bob domestic cat. Yet authorities and the judge ruled that because the paperwork that they brought it to the vet and wrote on was a Pixie Bob, that that's what they were going by, the paperwork to the veterinarian. So this Bobcat got returned to the private owner. I'm assuming she's been loose again. I'm assuming she's bit again. Um, rarely do we see somebody priving, privately owning Wild cats as pets, keeping them for the life of the animal. They usually do not keep them after adolescence. So the good news is, is that there's not, there's to date no bona fide crossbreeding of a wild bobcat and a domestic cat. There's one instance from a breeder that's trying to sell that her captive bobcat bred with a domestic cat and genetics DNA testing supports that. But wild bobcats and domestic cats do not cross. Because can you imagine what would happen with our feral cat population and bobcats if they could cross? The hard thing is, is that most of the bobcats being sold or caracals being sold and servals being sold as pets have come from generations of generation in captivity. So somewhere along the way, there might've been a cross with a domestic cat. So sadly, what these owners are getting savvy to, not only are they claiming their bobcat is a uh, Pixie Bob, they're also requesting DNA testing from the judge because they know 
that in most captive born wildcats, just like captive born wolves, there will be a 5% domestic cat DNA or 5% dog DNA. And then the judges say, oh, well, if it's 5%, then it must be a hybrid. And we are, our job is we are educating authorities, edu educating humane societies and sheriff associations that this is not true. It is not that black and white based on how long the breeding has happened in captivity in the US. So how do you start telling what's a hybrid or not a hybrid? So this is a uh, first generation Savannah. So I'm gonna teach you like I would teach um, a shelter or humane society. You know, when Savannahs that are first generations look very servalesque, you know, they have that spot pattern that's very explicit. Um, it's, you know, tabby cats have different uh, markings than this for sure, a domestic tabby. Servals tail length is only about two thirds the length of a domestic cat's tail. They have huge ears, tall legs, deer-like features, fox-like features. Um, and so it's really how I train uh, authorities because they also come in different colors now um, <laughs> because people mix them with different domestic cats with the serval. So they're not always just this beautiful blonde pattern. They can be red, some of them can be more orange. And then when you get to the second generation, meaning they took the cat you just saw and bred it back to a domestic cat, like a Bengal again, then you get the F2 generation. And so to these, I would say is look like mini me's of uh, servals or savannas. They still have the big ears, the long legs. They are still a cat on steroids, at least knee high, still have that, you know, uh, not a full length domestic cat tail yet. And I won't go through every generation. But then when you get to the F4s, the, which like Tika and um, the cat, National Cat Associations, the breeders of cats say these guys are domestic cats. Now, the other, the first, second, third can be shown with Cat Fancy and Tika, but they're shown as hybrids. Even they support they're not domestic cats. So what I tell authorities, if it looks like a domestic cat, looks walks like a domestic cat, you can treat it like a domestic cat. We're not trying to go into homes and take people's f for savannas, but we will talk about why we need to curb the breeding of it because the amount surrender rates for these Bengals and savannah is, savannas is just enormous. So we talked about Bengals. So this is the first generation Bengal. So the F1, where one parent was an Asian leopard cat and one was a domestic cat. These, these are both F1 Bengals, but they're different Asian leopard cats they were bred with. And so the one way you sure tell of an F1 Bengal is I say they're more weasel-like than cat-like. Their eyes are really huge compared to their facial structure. They have smaller ears. Um, they have tails that they do not hold up like a domestic cat. They're low riders. They like to slink a lot and they're very, very good climbers. And so um, you can see in their coat pattern is just absolutely stunning, um, impeccable. Compared to a domestic Bengal, a domestic Bengal has a beautiful coat pattern, but its body shape, tail, and behavior is that of a domestic cat. It holds its tail up. It's not a low rider unless it's stalking prey in the grass. Um, they also usually have a very shimmery coat pattern called angel dust. And Bengals come in snow version, which are white versions, black versions. I mean, I'm not telling you the, the breeder names. I'm just telling you the coat colors. Um, and they come in rosette and spotted. So there's a huge variety of uh, Bengal cats and their colors. And then the Chasi, which is a jungle cat crossed with a domestic cat. And the jungle cat is a cat actually from Pakistan. It is a species of cat. This is a Joffrey cat hybrid. So a Joffrey's cat is a South American tree cat that is only about six pounds. So it's a very teeny cat. You can see the tail is almost as long as the body length. These guys are notorious climbers. I'm surprised this breeder actually has pictures of them on the ground because these guys are usually hanging from the rafters. Um, luckily, we're seeing these less and less because Joffrey's cat definitely do not make good pets. Um, they are they think they're a tiger in a you know a teeny teeny body. Um, and this is the newest one, the Kara cat, which is a caracal crossed with an Abyssinian. Now, the good news to this is this is a very 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 rare hybrid and a very, very, very expensive hybrid. The bad news is since it came out, people are buying caracals like crazy now for about $7,000 to $9,000.
falsifying the paperwork that they have a CARICAT to get around ordinances. And this just happened in New Jersey um, last year. It's happened in New York, um, a lot of it on the East Coast right now. And we're really trying to work with authorities to make sure that they know that just because you say it's something, it's not. If I brought you a tiger and says, nope, that's a dog, that's a dog. Come on, authorities, this is a dog. It's still a tiger. And that's what I want to teach them with cases like this. Is just because the owner tells you that it is something or they wrote it on a piece of paper does not mean that's what it is. And this is happening, you know, there's a lot of issues with this is this is a case Lloyd that you might know that just came in and Lloyd was surrendered uh, by a private owner here in Minnesota. And he was an F1 Savannah. He bought them for like $3,500 a piece from a breeder in Texas. And um, he gave us Lloyd because Lloyd was urinating all over the house and uh, could not touch him. Lloyd is not social to people. And uh, so unfortunately upon Lloyd's intake, this is what we found in his mouth and um, granulomas. And luckily uh, we've been able to treat that. But it occurred to me when he was talking to me that he had a second Savannah. And I asked, where's the second Savannah? Because Gina picked him up. And he said he had gotten loose and they'd never found him again. And I went into my head and went, oh my God, on Facebook, I have seen this cat come through the feed. And everybody asked me, is this cat a serval? And I kept saying, well, it's a Savannah. Um, you know, and that the white one here was a non, what I call a uh, it's a F1 Savannah, but it's non-standard, meaning it's not the gold color. Uh, and so we do not know what happened to this Savannah. He could still be loose. He could have been dead. Somebody could take him in the home. We do not know. And then here is even uh, Savannahs we have that were one on the left. Thor was put on Craigslist for $3,500. She'd paid $7,000 for him. He was urinating all over the house. She loved this cat to death. She really did. She put diapers on him. She put timed walks outside. She tried everything to not have him pee all over the house. But in the end, she decided to rehome him and sell him for a lot of money. And we had a donor reach out. And I had to say is if you got this kitten, you love this kitten, you are in tears over this kitten, and you can't keep this cat because of its ur territory urination, which is so common in these hybrids we'll talk about, why do you think that somebody else that gets him as an adult that hasn't bonded with him is going to tolerate that behavior? And so luckily she chose to surrender to us because otherwise we see these hybrids get rehomed and rehomed and rehomed again. And Leo, the F1 here, uh, he's not an F1, so <laughs> I can tell you that, but um, Leo was on Craigslist free to a good home because he had been territory marking and he was beating up other cats. And um, so they, at one years old, declawed him on four feet and sequestered him to the garage and then put him on Craigslist. And luckily a donor went and picked him up, did not pay anything for him, and then asked if we could take him in. And then Hilo and Ledger. The other thing we're seeing is these savannas and hybrids are ending up in feral cat colonies, which is an issue because we already have a feral cat population. If we start having a 30 pounds each cat of feral cat population um, and not native to our country, we're gonna have some bigger issues. And I'm gonna talk about why we're seeing such a high surrender rate of all these cats and why they are not making good household pets. There are some confusion too, so I would like to cover this. We never support buying from breeders, honestly, when there's so many domestic cats and dogs that need a home. And right now you can go to Pet Finder and almost rescue and bring any breed you want into your home without having to go to a breeder. We understand people do buy from a breeder and it doesn't make you evil. We're just really trying to focus on um, decreasing the population of cats that are surrendered. And so these are cats that look like the like a wild cat, but are 100% domestic. And so I'm not um, endorsing them as much as I try to help educate people that yeah, that is not a bobcat. That's a you know that's a Highland Lynx or you know a Pixie Bob or uh, the Aussie cat looks like a Bengal, but it's it's a hundred percent domestic cat. So, so why are we seeing these at such a sur huge surrender rate? We know the first thing is the overbreeding, right? We talked about it because they're lucrative in the pet industry. They're going to be using them for inter animal interactions now, and so there's going to be a surplus, and there already is a surplus. 
So the biggest thing we see health-wise is when small wildcats, especially African servals come into us, it is a cruelty issue because I would say now we're looking at 70% of the servals coming to us have severe metabolic bone disease. Most of those are due to poor nutrition and not genetic like chili the serval. Um, this is cruel to the animals. Having fractured bones, having bones that um, concave and things like that, this is just a painful way to live. Um, other sanctuaries, we're gonna take in a rescued serval and unfortunately, upon intake, that cat had such severe metabolic bone disease and was in such severe pain, the most humane thing was to say goodbye. They come in with dental issues a lot too, and bowel obstructions, because people are having wild animals and trying to have them in their house like a domestic cat, and they're eating toys, they're eating furniture, and they're needing immediate surgery. So with the little hybrids, like the domestic Bengals or even the savannas, um, inflammatory bowel disease is a huge thing we see. So you'll see we spend so much money on individualized diets for all of our Bengals. There's so many supplementation they're on. Two cats with inflammatory bowel disease cannot be treated with the same diet and same meds. It really depends upon you know, how bad it is, what they're willing to eat. And the sad part about inflammatory bowel disease is even though we can control it, it often leads to intestinal lymphoma. So our hybrids, like the first generations, usually live maybe to be 10 to 12 years old. The domestic Bengals can live longer, but we see so many of them coming to us or the owner wanting to surrender because they can't get this under control. Um, if you think of, if you've ever had a small dog, you know you're always paying for dentals and extractions and cats have resorption. Uh, that's these Bengals, they, everybody else is on a three-year wellness exam. Bengals are on annual because of how bad their teeth are. And then a lot of them come with chronic upper respiratory issues, mostly because they were bred in cattery environments where there's a high volume of cats. And so we also can see FIP as well because of the cattery breeding. So when I was talking about Scarlet earlier, this is her chest bone that is completely uh, you know, concaved in her body and making it so she can't breathe as easily. That's metabolic bone disease. You see Chili down there, um, you know, Chili, his is more, uh, was genetic, but unfortunately that breeder was breeding and selling like crazy. So almost every serval we get from Canada has a uh, genetic metabolic bone disease. And a lot of this is poor nutrition. And, and then each species is different. So a serval needs something different than a caracal, needs something different than a lynx, needs something different than a domestic bengal. And so you can't just lump them all together. And what's amazing to me is people can always find and research on the internet where to buy an exotic cat, but somehow they don't do their research on how to properly feed or care for that exotic cat so that this doesn't happen. It just baffles me when um, Google search is so easy. Luckily, I'm only putting this up because this place is out of business because I'll never put up a breeder's website that you can go buy a wild cat from. But it just shows you, like, if you read through this page, it talks about why you should declaw um, cats and, and on forepaw. And we see such huge arthritis. We see regrowth going back into the pads and things. Um, we treat so much for arthritis due to declaws. It is one of the largest costs of our medicines. And then here they talk about um, defanging and teeth filing. Oh, if your cat bites you, take an emery board and file down its canines. That is the most cruel thing you can do and expose a root. Um, you know, you saw it with the bobcat Luna we have that that owner cut all of her four canines off at the gum line, just exposing all those roots. And USDA remind veterinarians that the USDA guidelines prohibit decline or tooth removal of wild cats, primates, and bears. So um, nobody should be doing that anymore for these wild cats. So why are they surrendered? Even the cute little domestic Bengals we have? Well, you know, these breeds are really high energy. I love them. People think I hate Bengals and that's why I want nobody to have one. That is not true. I love when I hear success stories. I love when our donors say they have a Bengal and it's working out because I know they're a committed person. And no matter what behavior that Bengal has, they're gonna keep that cat. That would not be a problem if that's what everybody was like. Um, you know, we look at people are adopting these cats for their looks. If you've been to the sanctuary, you heard me say, that's exactly the same issue with Siberian Huskies. People buy them and adopt them because they have beautiful blue eyes. They look like a wolf, they're gorgeous. 
But if it doesn't fit your lifestyle that you don't want a dog that can't be off leash, has a high prey drive, digs a lot, how well is that relationship going to work? Or if you married for just looks only, how long does that last? Well, people are buying these cats for the look and they're not researching the breed specific traits that is going to make a lifelong companion for them. So they're high energy. Bengals are like having a two-year-old child that never grows up and the world revolves around them. I mean, Benny in the office, he's a domestic Bengal. Every single moment of every single day, either it's Lynette, Dina, I, Judson, somebody's coming down to give him his fresh water, to give him a different treat on a different plate because that plate's not good enough and that food's not good enough. And he's screaming bloody murder and we love him. But he's one out of 41 Bengals that can live in our environment. The rest we can't because their territory urination is so bad. So the vocalization, they're very loud. But if I could blow up one slide and just put bad litter box habits, territory urination on one slide, this is the 90% why we get uh, the calls we do on the servals, savannas, and hybrids is I can't handle the peen in my house anymore. They have destroyed everything in my house. I have replaced my carpet a hundred times. And you know what? They don't stop peeing at the sanctuary. They don't stop having inflammatory bowel disease at the sanctuary. We just work around it. Um, but it is sad because if people knew going into it, it, it would be It'd be something that would be, I think people wouldn't do. So we, it, the more we lecture people, the more they want to bangle, right? So we'll go through this, but there's resources on our website. If you copy and paste the link of all the emails we've put of the people that have called us heartbroken because the animal they love, they cannot keep, that is what's going to deter people from doing it again. Because these are not horrible people. These are people that love an animal and usually they start out with a Bengal and then they get a Savannah and then they get a Serval. We call Bengals are the gateway cat. Um, and they just get in over their heads and they are heartbroken. They have to give up this animal. But at the same time, you know, if they would have done their research, they would have known the chance of them getting one that territory urinates is high. Yes, you might have one that doesn't. That's awesome. That's awesome that there is a success stories, but you have to be prepared to be committed if you do. Now, wild cats like the African servals imprint, I don't say they bond because wild animals imprint with their first owner and they often don't rebond or re-imprint, you should say, with another human. And so rehoming them is really, really not good for the cat. And then they just get rehomed again. And then all of these, the Bengals, the Savannas, the wild cats, they're nomadic. So People, first thing they do when they have a Bengal cat that pees, let them outside, let her outside. And guess what? They often don't come back. I said again, they're the Siberian Huskies of the cat world. Uh, we see so many of them ending up at animal control. So what do we do at the sanctuary right now? Like we have indoor outdoor spaces for our hybrids. They have so much to do and so many platforms to climb on. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, in the winter months, most of them still do okay outside, but we have a new plan moving forward since the small cat crisis is not going away. And even the African servals and caracals, they have free roaming outdoor areas, indoor temperature controlled bedrooms with lots of things to do in their rooms. So we talked about why enforcement is so hard because of the patchwork of laws and, you know, uh, ordinances. They're overlooked by authorities because they have bigger fish to fry. They had big cats to deal with. They have shootings to deal with. As we talked about, the owners mislead the authorities once their cats have gotten out, um, you know, and then the authorities get really confused what to do. First responders aren't a tra trained, so that's really a big challenge. And owners often reoffend. This is a uh, caracals right here at the top left. If these guys were out maybe four or five times, I think, in the neighborhood. And we were called several times, can you take them if we choose to seize? And I said, we'll be there tomorrow. You should seize these cats. They are repeat offenders. The cats are going to get killed. They're going to die of, you know, it was Michigan and it was freezing temperatures, or they're going to hurt a child or kill somebody's domestic cat. And um, they kept giving the owner back. So she promised that they went to uh, a facility and she promised and they believed her and told me, well, we're not going to seize. She, she said they're gone. And guess what? That night, they were back in the neighborhood and got out again. And so um, 
they gave her one more chance and she rehomed them to a facility that said they'll give them back once she moves. But uh, we hear it over and over, the reoffend. The re -offend. And this is Bruno, who was trying, this lady was trying to catch this cat that she kept seeing that was limping because he had a broken leg. But public safety is a risk. These cats have wild behaviors. They can lash out. They are not small like domestic cats. And a lot of people don't know, but the laws do not recognize our domestic cat vaccines, including rabies, in wild cats or the F1s through F3s. So if you have one and it bites somebody and you think giving that rabies shot, you can show the proof of rabies, uh, it's not legally recognized in any of these animals, so it does not count. And so in certain states like Minnesota, the animal will be required to be euthanized and tested for rabies, which means, you know, that's horrible. They kill the animal. In other states, they sometimes allow um, quarantine as long as the victim gets post-exposure rabies shots. And then we do have them affecting the ecosystem, just like feral cat populations and um, outdoor, you know, cat and wild cat breeding. Luckily, the bobcats aren't doing it with um, them, but the servals and savannas can definitely breed with domestic cats. And on top of it, it's a cruelty factor because these cats are injured, they can get starved. Um, you know, I know another sanctuary has a cat uh, serval replaced that was out three or four times. It has no ears, no tail. Uh, missing digits on his toes because it was frostbitten. I mean, that's just cruelty. Sorry, I was writing on my screen and I didn't know how, so sorry for the red dots lines there. So what are the solutions? You know, education is key. Uh, that's what we're here to do. We're sharing with you. We share in all our social media outlets. Um, we need to stop the overbreeding. You know, that's the big thing. And we can do that through um, education, future legislation, changing local ordinances. We do support adoption of domestic hybrids, the F4s through F6 generations by shelters and rescue groups with proper screening. And we teach them how to do that. You know, they do better if, if they came in as a cat soiling and not using the litter box, they should go to an only cat home or a dog home. Um, you know, usually Bengals are very much about their world. And if you add animals after them, uh, they start territorial marking. If you adopt them as together as siblings or as you know litter mates, they usually do pretty well. But we can also offer our services and helping authorities identify what generation a hybrid is. Um, and then obviously we do recommend if it's an early generation hybrid and all wild cats that they should be um, placed at a sanctuary. They should not be pre-adopted out. So what you can do, <laughs> don't do what Ledger's doing here, but he loves to give Ty his rear end. He loves Ty. Um, is help us educate, forward our posts and videos, you know, re report any exploitive social media posts showcasing exotic cats inappropriately. And if there's any abuse, there's a breeder in Wisconsin that threw her serval down on TikTok and caused like fractures in the legs. And that TikTok video was able to get prosecution. Um, support petitions and future legislation. I think we'll be drafting some and obviously open your home to a domestic cat in need. So a little bit about us. So how do you help us help them? Um, we are a home for life at the sanctuary. We have a long-term sustainability plan that our cats are going to be with us and we're going to be with them to the end of their days. Uh, they will not be rehomed. Um, and so help us expand. We are next year, you'll see our capital came, campaign starts for a small cat hybrid indoor building with indoor outdoor access. Um, our goal is that we can accommodate more hybrids and small cats, but we want their space to be dynamic year round. And with our uh, Minnesota winters, uh, we think having them to have a bigger indoor rooms and maybe catios versus the large yards will help them be able to use their space all year round. Sponsor one of our wild ones. Even our littles are as little as $12.50 a month or $150 a year. But our big cats, remember, we're still going to be doing big cat rescues. So definitely support that too. We're going to be announcing next week that we have some big cats to share with you that were recently rescued. And we have several pending cases too. Um, and we have a chewy wish list because our small cats diets and litter is really crazy expensive. We spend more on our small cat vet and food bill than we do on our big cats. Uh, we have a monthly pride program, so you can give any amount that's meaningful for you as little as $5 a month. 
Um, and the legacy pride, since we are an organization that has a strategic plan, that means uh, this sanctuary lives on without me. It is not about me. It's about the cats. It's about Gina. It's about Kelly. It's about succession. It's about keeping this alive for we can. Joining and leaving your own legacy is an awesome way to help our sustainability. And share our resources. If you want to learn more, if you go to our website, under education tab, we have a small cat crisis tab, but we also have a say no to hybrid cats tab. And if you click on that, that's where you'll also find all of the testimonials from people that needed to surrender their hybrid cat and how heartbreaking it was. So that's a really good one to share on social media. If you're on a breeder's page, you're just going to get hate mail back. So it's really teaching and educating the people that want a hybrid or a wild cat and intervene early and give them some better solutions so that their heart's not broken um, when they have to give them up. And here's another thing is that the USDA is currently seeking public comment on exotic cats training and enrichment. So this is all wild cats and animals of saying, well, what should our new guidelines be for public interaction? and for training and for enrichment. Because can you believe the USDA requirements don't even require that you provide enrichment to, to cats? Um, and so ask them to stop pay to play of wild animals. The due date is here and Gina will definitely, we can put this link in the comments too or email us and we'll be sharing probably um, on our social media, but it's the last time to hear is April 10th and they have all these requirements you need. Honestly, don't just type a paragraph of what you think and post it. Um, they have like, tell us the pros and cons, tell us that. Just say it in your own voice and it will truly make a difference. And so questions we're gonna open up in the chat. And then if you have any don't that aren't answered tonight, definitely email info at wildcatsanctuary.org. And I wanted to end it with us showcasing our domestic animals at the, the sanctuary, um, part of our keep the, you know, the wild in your heart, not your home motto. And so there's some of our favorites. And if you saw our Facebook live post today, we might have a new domestic cat joining the office if Mr. Oreo accepts. So um, I really appreciate you guys listening. And I'm gonna ask Gina if she has like any top questions that I can help answer. And unfortunately, I can't answer questions about individual cats. We just have too many people here, but you can always email us at info at wildcatsanctuary.org. And I'm happy to give you an update on one of your favorite cats. Awesome. Thank you, Tammy. There's lots of kudos coming to you in the <laughs> um, messages. I'm just saying that people really learned a lot, which is awesome. awesome. Um, one of the biggest concerns people have in the comments is this cat, Chloe the Serval, on Facebook and what people can do to help her get to a better spot. Well, the hard thing right now is it's not illegal. So it's really hard to do anything till we get laws passed. Um, but I do think the, the more comments that we post that say, here's the hard thing about social media and Gina, you can chime in as our social media guru. The more you interact with those pages, the more likes and the more they get uplifted. So it's better to go to a page like a Humane Society or somewhere else than it is to always just, even if you're giving that person, Chloe's page, a negative comment, you're giving that person an interaction and it's going to the algorithm and getting shared more. So some of that is about restraint and actually putting your comments and efforts into where it could make a difference and get more showcase. So like love the posts Olivia does on, um, you know, why a serval shouldn't be a pet or other sanctuary groups that talk about the small cat crisis. The more you engage with those pages, the more of those social media outlets will put those in the algorithms and they'll be seen by more people. Uh, I did have some questions come in from people that registered uh, to get the link afterwards, but had good questions. Um, if TWS gets so many requests for small wildcats and hybrids, how do you decide which ones we help? Great question. Um, we've always said that to help an animal, we have to end a cycle. So we don't take breeder surplus. Um, with the small domestic Bengals, we really take from the shelters and rescues that call us because they're on the euthanasia list, meaning they've already been deemed um, unadoptable and have been back to the shelter multiple times. So our, we can't take every Bengal somebody calls us on, and we don't want to. We want to take the cats that don't have any other alternative. 
So we'll refer the people that call us to behaviorists. We'll refer them to um, their local humane society or shelter that then can really screen the cat and see if it was just the wrong home environment. Um, the small cats, like the wild cats, we are 100 percent committed to absorbing those or working with the Big Cat Sanctuary Alliance to place all those. So we haven't had to turn away servals or uh, caracals. Bobcats right now, every sanctuary is full with bobcats, even if, you know, the, the bobcat and the servals are the biggest calls right now. So sometimes there has to be a uh, talk with the owner of how long or how quickly the cat has to move. And if it's not, if it's just they've decided it's time versus it's a legal issue, then we can wait and find a home for it. But um, good questions. Uh, do you ever adopt out Bengals? <laughs> you know what? This is a good lesson. In the early days, we did, and they all came back to us. Um, and that's hard. Like, we would adopt one out to a staff member, you know, who really knows the pros and cons. But I mean, put it this way Ashes, who everybody loves, everybody tried her in the bunkhouse, her in the intern house, and she just peed everywhere. Um, so we know that the cats that come to us really need to be with us. I think Benny is like the exception, um, you know, and things like that. And that was more, he was in a state that couldn't adopt about, out Bengals. But uh, yeah, we don't because they came back and then it was hard to merge them back into the group and then their health issues had flared up. And so really, if they are adoptable, we really try to refer them to a rescue or a shelter. And how much attention do the hybrids get? <laughs> Good question, because we always promote we're a no contact facility. So the servants and caracals don't get petted, but every hybrid that wants attention gets loved on. Um, we The staff goes in there, the interns, they end up coming for the big cats and they leave saying the hybrids are their favorite of all. Um, there we have a lot of cats that we really teach to be neutral because a lot of the F1s, especially the Bengals, are elusive, intimidative people. So we don't want your energy to be too high, but they get attention every day. People go in there every day, um, we allow it. And we just have to educate that the reason we're doing it isn't to promote they make good pets. So anytime it's shown, we explain why they're um, giving them love and attention. But these guys came from home environments and were on people's laps and in their beds. and. You know, we want to still give them what they deserve just because they were surrendered for ruining the house doesn't mean they don't deserve love. Great. Uh, I think we probably have time for one more question. Um, and it's a hopeful look to the future, but um, what would it look like to get legislation started for the small cat crisis? Well, it's usually started state by state. And once you have a couple, uh, states that are doing well, then that's how we eventually remember it took almost 12 years to get the Big Cat Public Safety Act passed. So we worked with Animal Legal Defense Fund last year and started a petition in California because that's really where the heavy breeders are. It did not get passed, um, sadly, but we have now language that was great to use because Iowa was adopting some of that language. Um, I know Nebraska adopts some of that language. So we hope to this year to put some ordinance and templates on our website and it'll start with the wildcats and probably put the hybrids separate because the hybrids can really tie up stuff because they are cats genetically caught between two worlds. And so um, I think we will keep education strong with both, but start with the wildcat legislation and, and go from there. Definitely well, yeah. a marathon. <laughs> yeah, it's a marathon. Um, I just want to thank you guys enough for caring enough to come to learn about this. I mean, the big cats get so much attention and it's well deserved. They, you know, do not deserve to be kept in captivity and exploited, but we don't want to forget the small um, Bengals and caracals and servals and the bobcats. Bobcats get a bad rap because people think they all look the same. And honestly, that is the hugest, biggest need right now is placement is for bobcats. And bobcats are a little harder to house because depending upon the bobcat, you might need a roof, which makes it harder to do a big habitat or open, you know, and, and so people always say, you can take another bobcat. Well, you'll have to talk to our bobcats because we, out of our 27 or whatever we have, um, we have every female almost wants to live alone. So they're in their five to 7,000 square foot habitat on their own and says, mm-mm. 
don't bring another partner in here. I get this all myself if I don't share. So um, I just thank you guys for caring about the littles as much as you do the bigs. And I just want to say, I love you guys so much. I know you support us in so many sanctuaries and I love seeing, um, it's not even the TWS fans, it's the cat fans here, um, you know, supporting the cause. So thank you guys and be proud of yourselves for all you help us do. And have a great night. Email me at info at wildcatsanctuary.org with any further questions.